I've been here since um, Wednesday, and I just want to do a big wow, but I want you to do the wow with me. So after one, two, three, let's hear this wow. Wow! I trained in mime and physical theatre, so that's, yeah. And, and that wow is to just say that all of you sitting here are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Yeah. The fact that you are here means that you have broken or began to break the intergenerational trauma. You began to break the family pathology. And we also know that there are some people who just don't make it. And I just want to um, call Penny, Penny Seegers, who was my white sister, who didn't make it. I, I grew up in group homes, and she didn't make it. And I want to give you an opportunity to just all together call out some of the names, some of the women who didn't make it. This, yeah, it is a matter of life and death, yeah. And I want to talk about freedom today. In fact, I have a lot of freedom and there's still more freedom for me to have. Today, when I walked into that patio and saw you eating your cheesecakes and <laughs> sugar and I can't eat that. But once upon a time, I would have been eating it and had my head down the toilet, okay? Yeah. So when people ask me about my abstinence, I'm abstinent from sugar because I know that if I eat sugar, I will have my head down the toilet. But let's talk about this. First of all, my talk, yes, is named Free Yourself from Mental Slavery. Who, who does that? Is that great? So you can sing those two lines with me because I have to confess, not all black women can sing and I'm one of them who cannot <laughs> sing, okay? And I need your help. And we need, you know, I will let me talk about help because actually, one of the reasons that I stayed in that hell realm of addiction is because I did not ask for help, okay? If we think of Jesus Christ on the cross who said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Ask for help. The Buddha, before he became a Buddha, touched the earth and said, let the earth be my witness and ask for help. And we need to ask for help if we are going to have freedom. So, join me. I'm asking for your help so I can have a bit of freedom so that I do not have to have the identity I cannot sing. So the words are, free yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. After one, two, three. Free yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our mind. Yes. I got my recovery in the rooms of meditation. And I often say, if you hear me talk, that meditation is my Prozac. I should be on every drug that there should be going. I was fortunate because meditation came into my life in my early 20s. And I often say to people, when people are really struggling, um, struggling with their addictive behaviors and, and they assume that they should get over it in one year or two years, three years, I say, listen, if you've had a truckload of trauma, it is gonna take many years for you 
to get onto that road of recovery. Yeah. I was fortunate. I, I, was, I was addicted to meditation. In fact, I remember during the millennium, all my mates, you know, I grew up in London. We're, we're party people. And all my mates, they were talking about all the parties they were going to be going to during the millennium, all the drugs they're going to be taking. I said, I'm going on a free week retreat because I know that I'm going to get high, I'm going to have altered states, and I will have moments of visiting the divine. Yeah. But I want to say something about meditation because... Many people who work in the field of addiction or in the field of trauma assume meditation. Let's give people meditation. Meditation can be the most activating thing you can give to somebody as soon as they walk through your doors. Let's face it, you know, when you were in your hell realm of addiction, did you want to sit with your legs crossed, your eyes closed, thinking one breath, two breath, three breath, four breath? Hell no. <laughs> and what I want to say about meditation is, is that for those people who begin to meditate, what can happen is it will uproot things that you weren't even aware of that had happened in your life. And so if you are somebody who thinks, yes, I want to give meditation as medicine, it is really important to ask the person, how was it for you? And to give them the invitation to say they hated it, they didn't like it, okay? Because many people hate meditation. But for me, I was fortunate. It, it completely transformed my life. Freedom. It gave me freedom. I was one of those people, yeah, who had the committee in my head and I would stand like this and I would say, I hate myself, I hate myself, I hate myself. Yeah. And I would say that 10 to a dozen, I hate myself, I hate myself. But just know that these voices that we have in our heads are protectors. They are, even our addictive behaviors are protectors. We heard about compassion last night. And I want to say to you, one of the most compassionate things that we can do for ourselves is to actually recognize that actually our adaptive behaviors, our addictive behaviors, those negative voices that we hear in our head is trying to protect us. Yeah. They're trying to do a job. Okay? Yeah. That is being compassionate because often we find ourselves wanting to destroy it, we want to hate it, we want to destroy it, and that just makes us sicker. You know, I'm married to a big book thumper. <laughs> Those of you who know their home, and she always reminds me it is not perfection, okay? And I tell you, I wanted the perfect recovery. I never, ever wanted to think about going out for that next whatever. I never wanted to think about having the next whatever. But those of you who have been in recovery for 10, 15, 20 years, you know that there are times when that thought will just come. You, where did it come from? Yeah. And we have to be kind to it. Whenever the voice arises in me, I hate myself. It, it doesn't arise often, but it's telling me, oh, I'm vulnerable. Whenever the thought thinks, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have, it's just telling me I'm vulnerable. And that is part of the freedom. I want to talk to you a bit about eight-step recovery. The reason why I wrote this book, because I wanted to share my recovery. And I want to tell you, actually, I had a lot of hate mail from 12-steppers, actually. A lot of hate mail. Yeah. But I believed, I, I believed, and I thought, well, 
if it really does cost my life. I mean, you know, I, I, being an addict, it almost costs my life. And if you want to know how it almost cost my life, then you can read one of my books. But I want to talk to you a bit about eight-step recovery because the first step is accepting that this human life is suffering. For me, that was freedom. It's, it's the first noble truth that there is suffering. It's not saying that life is suffering. It's just saying that we will suffer. And the reason why that teaching gave me freedom, because I thought I was the only one who suffered in the world. I thought I, thought I was the only one who was suffering. You know, I was in my own in, you know, navel gazing or whatever you call it, but I believed I'm the only one I'm suffering. Why am I suffering? And when I read that, I thought, oh my God, I'm normal. I thought there was something wrong with me because I was suffering. Yeah. The second step is seeing how we create extra suffering in our lives. Yeah. And when I read that, I was like, oh yeah, I can really see how I create extra suffering in my life. And that, again, was freedom, absolute freedom. Let me give you an example. My core addiction is food, OK? And I've actually, in, in, in my worst days, I was between 60 and 70 pounds. And the heaviest would have been about 170 pounds. I would have been 300 pounds if I had the courage to keep hold of the food because everything that went in me was actually purged out, okay? And I could not walk past a bakery without not finding myself in it. It was almost as if this tiny homunculus was on the seat of my brain and drove me into that shop, okay? And I'm telling you, there were times where I binged and purged and I would have, if, if you're getting activated, resource yourself. You can look at my shoes, yeah? I can distract you or you can look up at, at the ceiling as well or look around or walk and get up because, you know, yeah, these talks sometimes can be activating. But I was so much in my disease that there was a point where food got lodged into my windpipe, jumping up and down. I don't know how it managed to dislodge. It dislodged. And what was I doing 20 minutes later? Back out binging, OK? That was how one of the ways of how I was creating this extra suffering in my life not being able to be with the pause, yeah. Because for so many of us who have had these addictive, adaptive behaviors, find it very difficult to be in the pause. If you grew up in a dysfunctional home and you grew up in chaos, then when the pause is there, you're not gonna want it. It's gonna be scary because in that pause, you're gonna think, oh my God, what the hell is going to happen next? The pause isn't safe. And we have to learn to be with the pause. Okay. Also, when I'm talking about the pause, the pause helps us to come back home to the body. Many of us who have addictive behaviors are not at home in the body. We've left the body. We've turned all the lights off. All sense doors have been closed down. Nobody is home. Yeah. Because that's the safest place to be. And how do we come home to the body? And when we stay out of the body and in our addictive behaviors, we are continuing to create that extra suffering. Because we're already suffering. That's the reality. We wouldn't, why, you know, if you're in pain, why wouldn't you want to pick up something to 
soothe yourself. Okay? Because this is what we're trying to do, is to soothe ourselves, to protect ourselves, to take care of ourselves. Yeah. This is what we're trying to do. But at the same time, it is creating extra suffering in our lives. And I love, there's this great Buddhist saying which says, before enlightenment, it's chopping the wood and hauling the water. And after enlightenment, it's chopping the wood and hauling the water. Yeah. And that's what we have to learn. But what I want to say is, after, not, I'm not saying I'm enlightened here, but let's say after recovery, when we get on that road of recovery, chopping the wood and hauling the water is a lot more easier because we have reduced the suffering because we have some freedom. Yeah. The third step is actually being willing to step onto the path of recovery. Now, in the traditional Four Noble Truths, the third truth is that there's an end of suffering. And I'm telling you that, and then the fourth truth is that there is a way out of suffering, but I'm telling you, if somebody had told me that the third truth was that there was a way out of suffering, I wouldn't have continued. The fact that the truth is that there is an end of suffering was just, I think, because I just thought there was no end to this suffering. Yeah. So as I say, I describe my disease, I was in the hell realm of addiction. Yeah. When I wasn't purging, then I would be going to other things to give myself respite. Yeah. And actually, if any of you are here in this room now and are still struggling, I want to tell you, that there is an end of suffering. I was a chronic relapser. Yeah, chronic. And one of the most compassionate things we can do when we relapse or slip is actually just give ourselves a hug and tell ourselves, you know what, it's okay. You know, sometimes I have people who walk through my door and they tell me that their partner has just died and they've, they've relapsed. And I say, well, of course. Yeah, I get it. Of course, you needed to soothe yourself. I get it. Don't give yourself extra suffering because when you beat yourself up for that, then you will stay in that relapse for months and months and months and months. But if you could actually see, okay, that's what I needed, but in the next moment, I can do something different. My partner always says there's no such thing as relapse. Actually, she actually says, you pick up, and in the next moment, you can put it back down. Yeah. And that's a really great teaching for me. That is freedom. Yeah. You can pick it up, and in the next breath, put it down. I want to give you a small teaching which is called FIDO. And this is a teaching that came from my uh, swag bag of working in the field of conflict resolution. And it's a teaching that I've done with kids as young as six, seven, and to adults as old as 80. And for me, it's such a liberating teaching because often, we think our thoughts are facts. And that's what gets us into trouble because we identify with our thoughts. We think that our thoughts is me, mine, and I. Yeah. And actually, if you could just see that this is not me, this is not mine, this is not I, it could give you some freedom. But let's use a generic example. A generic example is I've been in, well, I've been a chronic alcoholic, okay? And I've been in a relationship for maybe 20 plus years, and my partner has given me an ultimatum. My partner says, it's either the drink or me. 
And I say, okay, all right, I'm really going to do it this time. I'm going to go into rehab. I really, 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 really mean it. I go into rehab, and I do my nine months in rehab. I come out, and I have the conversation with my partner. And you just listen to this conversation, you know, because you know that there's been, there's been these conversations in rehab, so I've rehearsed this conversation. I come out, and I say to my partner, you know what? I know that you're not an alcoholic. I know that, you know, you just like the old drink. I hate people like that who can just have one drink. And that's it. Do you know what I mean? Like, people who can have one bite of chocolate and put it back in the fridge and not look at it for two weeks. I hate those people. I do. I'm not compassionate to those people. Okay. So I tell my partner, you know what? Just, 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 if you could just hide the drink for me. And, you know, my partner says, well, why haven't you told me in all these years? Of course, so, you know, I want to support you. So, okay, partner hides the, hides the alcohol. So I've been out of rehab for three weeks, and I begin to get a bit bored. And let me tell you, this place of boredom can be the most activating place. In fact, there is such a high correlation of people coming out of rehab and actually overdosing and dying in their first month. And you know why? It's because of the boredom, nothing much going on. And so they want to mix it up or go out and, you know, have that little splurge, okay? So anyway, I'm out doing the garden work and I'm, I'm a, a bit activated and I think, okay, I'll go into the fridge and I'll just have a, a glass of milk or something and I open the fridge and I put my hand in, and as I go to pick up the glass of milk, there's a bottle in there. And it's like, my wife is trying to sabotage me. I'm a piece of shit. Nobody, nobody thinks I can do it. This drink is talking to me. This is a sign. I knew I should drink. This is it. This is telling me what I should do. So what do I end up doing? The decision I make is to drink. And the outcome is that I end up going on a bender. Yeah. But let's look at this again. Same situation. Had that conversation when I come out of rehab with my partner. My partner agrees to support me. I've been out for two or three weeks, been doing garden work. I'm a bit restless. I go in. Side, I go into the fridge, I open the fridge, I put my hand in, grab the milk, and as I move it, I see a bottle. What's the fact of that situation? Speak louder, what's the fact? I have the hand on my milk, great. And what's another fact? Pardon? Your partner was hiding it. She hid it behind the milk. That's an interpretation, and that interpretation will get me picking up the drink. The fact is, there's just a bottle in the fridge. And with that fact, I could shut the fridge and walk away. But we know, okay, we absolutely know that, you know, if we are an alcoholic and we know that there's a bottle in there, that we're going to be trying to find some way to get in there. And so we would have to have that conversation with our partner. But let's look at this again. So what's happening in this situation? We open the fridge, we put a hand in, we grab the milk, and we see the bottle. Butterflies groin gets itchy, teeth start grinding, and we begin to feel really unpleasant, and the thoughts kicking, I'm not meant to drink, I don't want to drink, I don't want to ever, and we go into the interpretations, you know, that it, our partner's trying to set up, and those interpretations are trying to move away from the discomfort in the body. That's what's happening. And what we have to learn to do is to be with the discomfort. I actually, you know, we talk about fight, flight, freeze. For me, 
there is the wisdom side of freeze. I remember, I remember being out to dinner a few years ago with a friend. It was, I, it was a tali you know, with all those different dishes. And me, the food addict I, I'm at, I pick up the first dish. Um, normally, the, the sweet dish is white, but actually this one wasn't. I pick up the dish, I put the spoon in my mouth. It's sugar. And the magnetism, I'm there. The magnetism, and in that freeze, something melted because I was able to stay with the discomfort. The ma it's like, you know, whatever your choice of addiction is and you're trying to stop and you see it, it's like a magnet. It's like it's pulling you towards it. It's, 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 it's you know, I can see you shaking your head and it's like, and if you can stay in that freeze, it doesn't last forever. And we melt and we can do something different. But the problem is we try to fight that. And when we try to fight it, we go back to our default. And our default is, OK, well, I'll, I'll just consume it. I'll take it. Yeah. OK. So freedom. Remember that your thoughts are not facts. And be aware of when you go into interpretation, OK? Because what I want to tell you is, is that my biggest addiction, I can remember waking up in my bed and thinking, oh my god, my biggest addiction is my stinking thinking. And it was like I was a rabbit caught in headlights. And I could just see it so clearly that that was my biggest addiction. I was just so caught up with what was going on in my head. A friend uh, the other day was asking me, like, how do you, how do you deal with, with, with all this chatter, with all these voices, especially sometimes when p people uh, want to meditate? I can remember when I first started meditating, I couldn't believe the noise that was going on in my head. Yeah, some, I'm telling you, if some of you have got a bad memory, I'm telling you, partly the reason why you've got a bad memory is, is because you're so busy listening to what's in your head that you're not actually listening to the person who's speaking to you. In fact, some of you here would have been in your own head listening to what was in your head and not listening to me, okay? Because we get so caught up with that chatter in our head. But what I want to tell you is, when you notice that, be kind. It's that there is this chatter in your head. And one of the things you can do is turn it down, just as if you could turn the volume down. Or if you're a visual person, you can think, oh, my head is on fire. My mind is on fire. Turn the gas down, OK? Just turn it down, rather than putting more logs onto the fire, telling yourself, I'm crazy. Why have I got all these thoughts going on in my head? Yeah. It's normal, OK? Many, many people. You, you, you can see these people in, um, in, in, what would you say, in meditation rooms, sitting cross-legged, and you will think that they are peaceful. And I'm telling you, <laughs> they are not peaceful. OK? They are most definitely not peaceful, OK? So, freedom. Mm -hmm. And I want more freedom. I want to tell you, and I'll be really honest, I still struggle with food. I don't put my head down the toilet. I don't starve myself. I don't go on binges for days on end. But you know, when I, when I came here, I had to find where's the closest supermarket so that I could actually get the food that I need to take care of myself, you know? Last weekend, I was out, I was away. I, I, I can only go to, I can't go to a restaurant every day because of the 
the, there's always hidden sugars. One of the reasons why I never came to live in the States, because I had a green card. I could have lived in the US because of sugar. There's sugar in everything. And I just, if I get sugar in my system, I can't stop. Yeah? One of the reasons why I couldn't get my recovery in the rooms of 12 steps, you go into an AA meeting or an NA meeting and what do you see? Solid sugar. <laughs> Solid sugar. Yeah. yeah. So I still, you know, maybe there are, there are times that I struggle. That there are times when it's easy, but I, it, 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 it's like... Adi Shanti says this, once you think you've got it, you've lost it. And so I never, ever think that I've got it, okay? Because if I think that I've got it, I will get complacent, yeah? And it's a practice. There are times when I have sugar. Sugar gets in and I have to, that, that's when I have to use all the tools that I've got, yeah? And, you know, the addict that I am, if I call myself an addict, it's like I still get, you know, it's, it's like once upon a time, it was seaweed. Can you imagine I was addicted to seaweed? <laughs> of all things, chewing gum, yeah. What next? And, and again, one of the things that I say to people, if you want freedom, you can begin to play a game with your mind. What is your mind going to latch on to next, okay? What's it going to latch on to next, okay? Because we know we can let go of the alcohol and it will latch on to something else. We can let go of the person that we've been obsessing about and it will latch on to something else. But there is freedom when you begin to recognize that the mind is trying to latch on to something else. Because when you begin to see that's all your mind is doing, this monkey mind is trying to latch onto something else, we can begin to do something about it. Yeah. How am I doing for time? Am I time? Okay, I just wanted to, I wanted to end with this. I was um, surfing and I was looking for something, and it was a wow. I don't remember when I did this, but this is, you read my bio. This is my bio. Sugar addict from age six to 11. Shoe conditioner sniffing, age 13 to 15. Anorexia, age 17 to 25. Chronic bulimia nervosa, age 21 to 40. Upper Spreak, 20 to 35. Champagne, 20 to 38. Meditation from 27 to 55. Abandoned at six weeks. Three foster families before the age of five. I became a problem bleaching my skin. Entered orphanage age five. Named gruesome from five to 11. Sexual abuse, sexual assault from seven to early, seven to early 20s. Sent to live with biological mother, age 11. Taken away by the police, age 12, 12 and a half. Attempts at taking my life, age 12, 13 to 18. Went off the rails, age 13. Living on the streets, age 14 to 15. Locked up and incarcerated, age 15. Attempted to take my life, 18. Age 27, somebody tries to strangle me to death. And that was the point that changed my life, and I stepped on to the path of freedom. Thank you.